Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can through Patreon at patreon.com slash CanadaX. Every dollar you give helps keep the podcast going, and you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Ottawa is the capital of Canada, and every school child in Canadian knows that. It's been our capital since before Canada was even a country. But how did it become the capital? It was once a small village known for its lumber camps until it was chosen as the new capital of the province of Canada. Now it would seem as an odd choice for the time considering there were much larger communities such as Toronto, Kitchener, Montreal and Quebec City, but it was chosen for some very specific reasons. I am going to look at how Ottawa became our capital today, but before we get to that we need to look at how Ottawa, or as it was once known, Bytown, came to be. The indigenous people had used the area for centuries, travelling up and down the Ottawa River. When explorers and traders arrived, the word Ottawa began to appear on maps coming from the Algonquin word Ottawa, which means to trade, because of the importance of the area for trading among the indigenous. There was no permanent European settlement until Philium Wright came along and settled in the area on March 7, 1800, located across the river from present-day Ottawa. Wright, along with five families and 25 laborers, set about creating a new community called Wrightsville. Wright would also pioneer the lumber trade of the area, which would soon become its most important economic activity. On September 26, 1826, the community of Bytown was founded, named after John By, a colonel with the British Royal Engineers who was instrumental in the construction of the Rideau Canal. The community popped up as land speculators came to the area after it was announced that the British would be building the north end of the canal at the location. In 1828, Joseph Bouchette described the community as such. The streets are laid out with much regularity and of a liberal width that will hereafter contribute to the convenience and elegance of the place. The number of houses now built is about 150, most of which are constructed of wood, frequently in a style of neatness and taste that reflects a great credit upon the inhabitants. On the elevated banks of the bay, the hospital, an extensive stone building and three barracks stand conspicuous. Nearly on a level with them and on the eastern side of the bay is the residence of Colonel Bai, commander royal engineer of that station. Colonel Bai would lay out the streets of Bytown, and many of those streets still exist including Wellington Street, Rideau Street, Sussex Street, and Spark Street. In 1855, Bytown would be incorporated as a city and would be renamed Ottawa. Two years later, everything would change for the city. First, we're going to take a look at the province of Canada. Now in a previous episode, I looked at the province of Canada and the difficult period that was for the people who lived in what would one day be Canada. It was a time of corruption, unrest, and anger towards the British government. But it was also a time that would see the capital move continuously, it seemed. The province of Canada was formed in 1841 and Kingston was the capital, remaining so until 1844 when it was moved to Montreal. It would remain as the capital until 1849 when, when rioters protesting the Rebellion Losses Bill burned down Montreal's Parliament buildings. At this point, with the Parliament buildings destroyed, the capital was moved to Toronto and remained there until 1852 when the capital was again moved to Quebec City, where it remained from 1852 to 1856, and then back to Toronto for one year in 1858, followed by a return to Quebec City in 1859. The city would remain the capital until 1866. Now at the same time, Queen Victoria had been asked to choose a permanent capital for the province of Canada, and in 1857, she would choose Ottawa. The process to choose a capital was not a quick process, and since 1841, Queen Victoria had been asked no less than three times to choose a permanent capital. Now, Ottawa by 1857 was beginning to grow in size thanks to the completion of the Bytown and Prescott Railway in 1855. In 1857, it had a population of about 7,700 people, with lumber being the biggest income maker for the city. Sir Richard Scott, a lawyer in Ottawa, soon began to see the potential for Ottawa's growth if it were made the capital. 
At the time, he had served as a member of the Municipal Council in 1851 and as the mayor of Bytown in 1852. At that same time, Ottawa's lumber industry was not doing so well and property values were low. Scott would write, The location of the seat of the government at the central point would tend to develop equally the growth of the two Canadas in the very region where a stimulus is required. The location of Ottawa, seen at the time as a frontier town, was perfect in the mindset of Scott because it was midway between Toronto and Kingston, the two former capitals in Canada West, and Montreal and Quebec City, the two former capitals in Canada East. In 1856, politicians came together to consider the claims of five cities to the new capital. These cities were Quebec City, Toronto, Kingston, Montreal, and Ottawa. Now there was no general consensus on the capital, and 48 votes were held that year to no resolution. No city won or maintained the support of a majority in any of those votes. The only solution was to have Queen Victoria choose the capital. On March 24, 1852, the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Canada passed the following resolution. 1. That the interests of Canada require that the seat of the provincial government should be fixed at some certain place. 2. That a sum, not exceeding £225,000, be appropriated for the purpose of providing the necessary buildings and accommodations for the government and the legislature at the certain place. 3. That a humble address be presented to Her Majesty, praying that she may be graciously pleased to exercise the royal prerogative by the selection of some one place at the permanent seat of the government in Canada. The vote passed with 61 in favour and 50 against. Now, Sir Richard Scott had powerful support to make Ottawa the capital, including Prince Albert, the consort of Queen Victoria, who wrote a memorandum that favoured Ottawa. In addition, Prince Albert's personal secretary, Colonel Grey, also supported Ottawa as the choice. Sir Edmund Head, the Governor General of the Province of Canada at the time, toured each potential capital site as well, and his recommendation was that Ottawa was the best choice. The reasons for this choice came down to the position of Ottawa on the continent. It was between the other choices geographically, but it was also defensible thanks to its position and was far from the American border. It is important to remember that it had been only 45 years previous that the Americans invaded Canada, sparking the War of 1812. Other reasons for Ottawa included the Rideau Canal and railroads made it easily accessible from all parts of Canada. A large population could grow in the heart of the country, it would increase the revenue of the Rideau Canal and the railroads, and Montreal would benefit from the commercial influence of Ottawa. In the fall of 1857, Queen Victoria came to her decision. Ottawa would be the capital, but this was not announced until December 31st of that year. On December 18, 1857, Prince Albert sent a letter to Henry Le Bircher, the colonial secretary. It stated, I return the enclosed papers with very best thanks. Ottawa must indeed be a beautiful situation, and all the detached descriptions must tend to confirm the impressions that the choice is the right one. We must now trust that the province will look upon it in the same light when it becomes known. Once it was announced, it was hoped that the Queen's decision would put an end to the question of where the capital would be, but it did not. Many politicians rejected the Queen's choice for the capital. The Queen's royal prerogative was set aside, and both, as I mentioned, Quebec and Toronto, served as the capital over the next few years. Now, Ottawa may have been chosen as the new capital, but it would be nine years before it actually hold a session of Parliament. A public debate began over the issue of the Queen's choice, and whether it was an award or a recommendation, and there was a concern that the decision had not been hers, but the Colonial Secretary. Nonetheless, even with the issues over whether or not to actually choose Ottawa, a resolution by the Legislative Assembly was passed that provided £225,000 for the erection of the permanent government buildings. On May 7, 1859, architects submitted their designs, and in 1860, construction began. After delays, cost overruns, and more, Parliament Hill would be completed and ready, somewhat, for the Confederation of Canada in 1867. The Parliament buildings would not be completed officially until 1876. As for Ottawa, the effect of being the seat of government would change it forever. It would move away from being a lumber town to a more sophisticated community as more and more people moved in to Ottawa. In 1857, the community had about 8,000 people. Within 15 years, its population was 21,000. 
By 1901, 101,000 people were living in Ottawa, and today it has 1 million people and is the fourth largest city in Canada. Ottawa today is the most educated city in Canada and home to several post-secondary research and cultural institutions, including the National Arts Centre, the National Gallery, and many museums. From a trading post for the Indigenous people, to a lumber town, to the centre of Canada's government, Ottawa has come a long way. Information comes from Wikipedia, Ottawa.ca, and the Canadian Encyclopedia. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Canadian History X, and if you did, again, please leave a like and review. You can also support the podcast at Patreon by going to patreon.com slash CanadaX, and you can email me any questions or ideas you have at craig at CanadaX.ca. And you can also visit my website where you'll see over 300 articles on Canada's history. Just go to CanadaX.com. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.